Hey everybody, uh, this is a video for my Econ 100B students on how to solve problem 11 from the homework. I'll do some other homework problems later, but today I wanted to get through that problem 11 one. It's a tough, tricky one. If there's time, I'll tack one more on. I'll add problem 12 onto it too. Um, but for now, let's get that problem 11 knocked out. So I'm going to go ahead and use the dot cam because this is a lot of math and a lot of equations, and I think that's the best way to take a look at it. So let's go there. So this problem starts with the supply and demand function for California tomatoes. And these are prepared tomatoes, and these functions both have natural logs. So I'm going to go ahead and write out the functions first. So the supply function is the natural log of quantity supplied is equal to, and I'm going to go ahead online in my lab, they put a lot of extemporaneous zeros in there. I'm not going to do that. I'm also going to zoom in a little bit. Let's get a little bit better view. Okay, hopefully that helps. Um, so I'm just going to skip those extra zeros and get to the point. Um, so supply is the natural log of quantity supplied is equal to 0.2 plus 0.55 times the natural log of price. And then demand function is the natural log of quantity demanded equals <clears throat> 2.6 minus 0.2. Remember that makes sense because we have a negative slope on our demand curve and a positive slope on our supply curve. Natural log of price. And then we also have a um, added to this a non-price determinant of demand which is the price of tomato paste. And it's also going to be the natural log of that PT. And that's going to be our variable of interest. And so what we're going to do is we want to see the effect of um, given that tomato paste is that um, price of the final product. Um, we want to see what the effect is of um, a change in that PT. So if PT is equal to $93, what is the effect of a 15% increase in PT. So change in PT is equal to 15%. And so the first thing we want to do is go ahead and find that equilibrium. Before we do that, just generally, I want to remind you that we do know some things about this, right? This isn't an unknown quantity, because what we know for sure is that this is going to have a positive effect. Because of this positive coefficient here, if PT goes up, we're going to expect the equilibrium quantity um, and the equilibrium price to go up. And we can think about that another way. When we talk about finding the effect of a shock qual uh, qualitatively, we can think about that here. So if we have some given market for processed California tomatoes, um, and some demand curve and some supply curve. If we're going to have an increase in a non-price determinant that is positively related to our demand, we're going to expect to see that demand curve shift out and the quantity and price to go up. So that just gives us, that's an example of how our understanding of the economic theory gives us a sense of when we're in the right ballpark and when we're not. Um, but that's not what's challenging about this problem. What's challenging about this problem is a couple of things. First of all, using natural logs, we have to do the inverse of a natural log, which means we have to take, excuse me, e to the y power. Um, and then the other thing is you have to be really careful about rounding to get the right number here. Um, so let's go back to the paper. So what we want to do here first is we want to solve for our equilibrium, and that's going to help us solve the problem. And if you look at the book, this problem is a problem from the textbook as well, and it references the prior problem where the first thing you do is you set supply and demand equal to each other. So we want to set supply equal to demand, and that's going to give us our equilibrium price, which is good because that's what we're trying to see. We want to see what the effect on equilibrium price is of this change in PT. So 
I'm going to go ahead and set those two functions equal to each other. And so there's my demand function is now set equal to my supply function, including that pesky natural log of the price of tomato paste. And then we want to go through and solve it using that PT equals $93, because that's our initial condition. So we can go through and say 2.6 minus 02 natural log of P plus, and it's going to be 0 0.15 times natural log of 93, right? So 0 0.15 times natural log of 93. Now I'm going to use my graphing calculator because it makes it a lot easier for me to track what I'm going through and saves me a lot of time rounding. So I'm going to get 0.15 times the natural log of $93 and I get 2.6 minus 0.2p plus 0.679, and I'll round up to that fourth integer, that fourth decimal point, 9. And then what I want to do is go through and add this to my 2.6, and that's going to give me a coherent, a, a, um, a reduced demand function. So I'll go through and say, okay, 0.2 plus 0.55. LNP is equal to 3.28, and I'll round up, minus 0.2 LNP. And now we can solve. I'm going to go ahead and add 0.2 LNP to both sides and subtract 0.2 to, from both sides. So that's going to give me 0.75 natural log of price equals 3.08. So far so good, hopefully. Scooch a little bit to get some more space. Now I want to solve for price. So the first thing I'll do is divide both sides by 0.75. So now I get natural log of P equals 3.08 divided by 0.75 equals 4.106 repeating. Here's the tricky thing. I went through and calculated it. If you round to 4.1066, you're going to get 1.1 cent difference. You really need to kind of hold that number coherent, and I'll show you that right now. So if I go ahead and take the inverse log function, which remember, if we have the natural log of x equals y, then the inverse function is e to the y equals x. So if I want to find p, which is my x, I just need to raise e to the power of y. So I'm going to go ahead and use my graphing calculator to take e to the power of that 4.106 repeating. And with my graphing calculator, it's super easy because I can just go ahead and enter that in. And you get P equals 60.74. If you were to instead go in and take the uh, raise E to the 4.1067 power, you see you get a little bit difference. Right now it's 60.745, which would round up to $60.75. So that is one of the tricky parts about this. But the good news is now I have my um, first step in my answer, which is I have the answer to the equilibrium price. That's my P star initially. Now what I want to do is find the new price at given a change in PT. Okay, so the next thing we want to do, we want to find that change in PT. So we said that 
PT is going to go from $93 to be increased by 15%. So what that means is um, if my PT was originally $93, I want to find the change in PT is equal to PT2 minus PT1. PT2 is equal to that $93 times 1.15, right? Because I want $93 plus an additional 15%. So that's going to give me um, a new price of $106.95, okay? Um, another way to do it would be to go in and say, okay, what is $93 times 0.15 and say 13.95, and then I wanna add that to $93 and that would still give me that $16.95, or $116.95. So that's my new PT. So one super easy way to solve for the new um, price is to go ahead and go through the same exact equation, right? I could just go through and say, okay, I know that O2 plus 0.55 ln P is equal to 2.6 minus O2 ln P plus 0.15 ln 106.95. So I can go ahead and calculate that. What is 15 times the natural log of 106.95, which is, oh, I did that wrong. Uh, 0 0.15. So that's going to give me 0 0.70, and I want to add that to that 2.6 minus 0.2 ln P, which gives me um, 2.6 plus 0.7, or 3.3. So now I have 0 0.2 plus 0.55 natural log of price equals 3.3 minus 0.2 natural log of price. And now I can solve again by subtracting um, 0.2 from both sides and adding 0.2 natural log of P to both sides. So I get 0.75 natural log of P is equal to 3.3 minus 0.2 is 3.1, divide that by 0.75, and I get LNP, or natural log of price, is equal to 4.13 repeating. And again, oh, I'm losing you guys, huh? Can you see that? There it is. Uh, that's the very end of the paper. Uh, again, it's easier with the, um, with the graphing calculator, okay? So I'll go ahead and say, I wanna take the, I wanna raise that, I'm gonna do the inverse of natural log, which is raise it um, e to that power. So I'm gonna take my ex function and then insert my answer. And that gives me a new price of $62.39. And And that's our answer. That's the new price. That is the new price that we find when we go through and increase the price of tomato paste by 15%. Okay? And again, there's a little bit of rounding error here with these kinds of numbers. It's always a little tricky. But now that we have our new price when... PT2 goes up and our old price, it's simply just going and saying, okay, 62 minus 39, or $62.39 minus $60.74 gives me a change in price of 62.39 minus. Edit that show. One sixty-five. Um, 
If you go through this question, they'll give you examples with different numbers. You can go up or down by some percentage and you'll get a little bit of a different number, but that's how you do this problem. Again, you wanna be careful of rounding. I'd say two or three decimal points will do you pretty well. Um, and um, let me know if you have issues with rounding errors on the pro problems and I'll go see if I can't override the, um, the points for you. But that's the basic activity. That's what we're doing here is we're solving for First of all, the simplified demand function, right? Here's the supply function, and then here's our demand function. And then we're solving for equilibrium price, changing the price of tomatoes, solving again for the new demand function, and then again for the new equilibrium price, and then finding the differences between P2 and P1. Sound good? All right. Okay, for question 12 on the homework, it's a reference to the application on occupational licensing or occupational closure, which is basically when there's some kind of license that um, you have to get before you get into a job, right? So think about getting a cosmetology license or a locksmith license. Um, it's, it's just an, it's a requirement needed for a job. And on the one hand, what this does is it reduces the supply of workers, right? And you can see that here, occupational closure or licensing reduces the supply of workers because it creates a barrier to entry, right? Now, um, so let's say there's an exam associated with getting a license to get a job. Um, and if there's only, the purpose is only to keep people out and kind of reduce the supply and drive wages up, that's one thing. But how would our analysis change if that occupational licensing, that exam that you were required to take before you did a job, meant that the number of people or the quality of people in that industry were better, right? Like a firefighter's exam, you have to do it to prove you're decent at the job. So if it's going to increase the quality of people in the occupation, what would that do to demand? Well, we're going to assume that higher quality workers, it's a marginal, um, or sorry, a value marginal product of labor question, right? So if we think that it's going to move us away from this equilibrium, that's what we want to show, okay? So that's what we want to show. We want to show the effect of increased value marginal product of labor if that occupational licensing exam is improving the quality of work. So we want to draw a new demand curve here on this graph, and we want to draw a new equilibrium point. So I'm going to click on there and get our drawing tool, and I'm going to draw a new higher demand curve. So I'll start up here, and I'm going to just pull it down to here, and I'm going to call it D3. Oh going on here? Oh good, that's just my label. And then I want to draw the equilibrium point. And if both things are happening at once, that's going to give us a new equilibrium. And I'm going to label that E3. And let's check our answer. Good job! We did it! So that's an example of two shocks in the same market. Um, you can draw your demand curve different ways, it should be fine. But basically what we're just talking about is um, shocks to a market, right? Things that shift the demand curve, things that shift the supply curve, and then finding a new equilibrium, which hopefully is something you're comfortable with. If not, let me know and we'll talk about it some more. All right, that's it for question uh, 11 and question 12 in the homework. I'll record a new video for the other two problems shortly. Okay, for question 12 on the homework, it's a reference to the application on occupational licensing or occupational closure, which is basically when there's some kind of license that um, you have to get before you get into a job, right? So think about getting a cosmetology license or a locksmith license. Um, it's, it's just an, it's a requirement needed for a job. And on the one hand, what this does is it reduces the supply of workers, right? And you can see that here, occupational closure or licensing reduces the supply of workers because it creates a barrier to entry, right? Now, um, so let's say there's an exam associated with getting a license to get a job. Um, and if there's only, the purpose is only to keep people out and kind of reduce the supply and drive wages up, that's one thing. But how would our analysis change if 
that occupational licensing, that exam that you were required to take before you did a job, meant that the number of people or the quality of people in that industry were better, right? Like a firefighter's exam, you have to do it to prove you're decent at the job. So if it's going to increase the quality of people in the occupation, what would that do to demand? Well, we're going to assume that higher quality workers, it's a marginal, um, or sorry, a value marginal product of labor question, right? So if we think that it's going to move us away from this equilibrium, that's what we want to show, okay? So that's what we want to show. We want to show the effect of increased value marginal product of labor if that occupational licensing exam is improving the quality of work. So we want to draw a new demand curve here on this graph and we want to draw a new equilibrium point. So I'm going to click on there and get our drawing tool and I'm going to draw a new higher demand curve. So I'll start up here and I'm going to just pull it down to here and I'm going to call it D3. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, good. That's just my label. And then I want to draw the equilibrium point. And if both things are happening at once, that's going to give us a new equilibrium. And I'm going to label that E3. And let's check our answer. Good job. We did it. So that's an example of two shocks in the same market. Um, you can draw your demand curve different ways. It should be fine. But basically what we're just talking about is um, shocks to a market, right? Things that shift the demand curve, things that shift the supply curve, and then finding a new equilibrium, which hopefully is something you're comfortable with. If not, let me know and we'll talk about it some more. There's a second part to this question and that just says, relative to the equilibrium at E2 in the labor market for licensed workers, the equilibrium wage is higher, lower, or doesn't change. And so we wanna just compare the equilibrium three to equilibrium two. So what does equilibrium three do? Well, it increases the equilibrium wage, right? And the equilibrium employment level actually does not change when the demand is affected by higher quality workers. Oh, didn't like that, did it? Increases, let's try that. There we go. Um, so I didn't shift my demand curve out quite far enough, but basically what we're looking for here is that there is a reason for occupational closure. It's increasing the quality of workers and that shifting of the demand curve further out is gonna raise wages and raise the quality of um, the quantity of workers overall. So that answers question 12. Let me know what other questions you have. Otherwise have a great day and I will record a new video for the other two problems, um, problems 15 and 16, a little bit later on. Thank you.